Like yes, I did, but I put the I redid it. Okay, um, redid another it. message, page four, five, and six, okay. in case somebody blinked and they didn't see it. So just uh, you know, reinforcement. If you have children, you know, you say, "Hey, Johnny, did you clean your room?" And then you turn around up. They, hi, did you clean your room? Right? And uh, oh no, you didn't clean. Did you clean your room? Right? So just uh, gentle reminders, okay? All right, so uh, let me make sure that you all see where I'm going. So this is, I think, probably the best way to get to the meat and potatoes of what we need to cover. So uh, when you have your textbook resources, and this goes for also MedSurge, that's old MedSurge, this is a new MedSurge. You'll go under student resources. <laughs> Excuse me. And we're going to go to chapter 21, Measuring Vital Signs. And this one is different from my other class. I'm thinking what's going to be the best way for you to use this. Okay, so this is probably what you're going to see with Mrs. Collins, and I know this is super small, you're not going to be able to see it. But these are the skills, right? And this is under the student view. And so these are the skills checklist. So measuring the temperature with an electronic thermometer. And so these are the things that you're probably going to be doing with Mrs. Holland, right? And I'm pretty sure everybody here can use a thermometer. But again, this is a checklist. We have to go by to make sure. Okay, so one thing with the thermometers, make sure you don't use a rectal thermometer on a patient um, on oral cavity, right? Like rectal is only supposed to be used on the rectal. And they're usually red. They have a red like circle around it or something. And don't say, oh, well, I put a probe over it. No, that is going in somebody's anus. Do not oh put that gosh. in somebody's mouth. Okay. No. Okay. So. Were you doing the, uh, you see, you have to say that? Uh, uh, yes, I'm just kind of showing it to you because this is something you can pull up um, later. But we're going to go over it with the, with the handout that I gave you. But you have no, a No, I have a question mm -hmm. about. Thermometer temperature somewhere. I don't want to say no place, but I read it somewhere. And correct me if I'm wrong. When you do it under the arm, you add or you minus one. Okay, so that is true. There's a difference of one degree, and you're supposed to uh, add under the add. arm. Yes, the okay. axillary. Yes. And so under the armpit, we call it the axillary temp. Okay, ax so here's a funny story. My daughter was a uh, you know 27 weeks preemie. Right when she finally came home. I was taking her temperature every day, right? Because she came home with the heart and apnea monitor and like all the stuff, right? And so she's fine now. She's nine. She's doing all these great things. So when, she, we, when we came home, I was like, okay, I'm setting my, my her nursery up like the NICU. Like we're going to be ready in case anything happens. <laughs> and so every four hours I would do like vital signs. So I was measuring her temperature, but I was doing it axillary. I was like, oh my gosh, she's got hypothermia. <laughs> so I was putting on all of these clothes and a hat and everything. And then I remembered like two days later that, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to add one. So her temperature is within normal limits. So, um, yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so don't do that to your patients. So I'm like, oh my gosh. And you know, infants, they can't sweat. Right. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm overheating my poor baby that just came home from the NICU. So, but yes, you, you add one. Okay, so hopefully you remember that funny, true story, uh, and you add one. Okay, but these are the checklists, and if it helps you, if you're a checklist kind of person, this can help you in your skills, especially too, like when you go over it with Mrs. Holly, okay? All right, so I'm going to turn our attention now, though, to the handout that I gave you. Because I like that handout because it kind of breaks it down. So I gave you a couple handouts. So I gave you the cheat sheet, right? And so you all have the cheat sheet. Let's talk about the cheat sheet. <clears throat> so the cheat sheet gives you temperature, right? And so that's the core. So uh, that's going to be normal. And it's giving it to you in uh, degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. 
most places uh, here will use Fahrenheit, but if you do with heat, sometimes they do use Celsius, and you have to be aware of that. And this gives you normal ranges. Okay, so you have to memorize it. This is your table in your textbook. So how many times you have a table is if you have to come one of the normal vital time uh, values. Everybody has a vital time handout here. So where is it on the table? That way. Okay, so page 363. Three, 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 so highlight that section in your book, please. Make a note, put a tab in it. Take a picture with your cell phone, whatever you want to do so you'll remember it, okay? Um, blood pressure, the normal blood pressure for an adult is 120 over 80, right? So that tells me if my patient's blood pressure is lower than that or higher than that, I need to kind of pay attention. Now, if it's like 119, 110, you know, even 100, that's not necessarily a, a bad thing, right? I, I don't necessarily get concerned about the patient. But if we're getting into the 90s over 60, 90 over 50, I've got to figure out what's going on with my patient, right? Because when a patient's blood pressure drops, I'm thinking, are they hemorrhaging, right? And so I also have to look at the clinical cues. I have to look at the scenario around the patient. Because if it's a post-op patient, a patient that just came out of surgery and their blood pressure is 90 over 50, I'm like, whoa, this patient is going into hypovolemic shock, meaning that they're losing volume, they're losing blood, they're bleeding, they're hemorrhaging, and that is like a red flag. If the patient's heart, uh, blood pressure rather is elevated, for example, I called my mother, she said, oh, my blood pressure is 220 over 110. And I'm like, okay, get off the phone with me, call 911 because you're in a hypertensive crisis, you're at risk for stroke and heart attack. So that's what we're talking about. Now, if you have, a, and my mom is alive still, so <laughs> she, she's a medical miracle. So if you have a patient with a blood pressure of 160 over 90, that is elevated. And I'm like, okay, I would ask, do you take blood pressure medication? Did you take your medication today? If you, and so of course, if not, then go ahead and, you know, uh, let them get their medication. I would also ask, are you in pain? Because pain can elevate a patient's blood pressure. Are you under a lot of stress, right? So these are the kinds of things, because yes, I know you're going to learn how to do these skills, but I want you to think critically, not just be a robot. Okay, I'm going to get your vital sign. <laughs> what do they mean? Okay, what do they mean? And that's what Next Generation NCLEX is going to be testing you on. Do you understand what it means? When you are in a clinical setting, if you have a patient's vital signs that are outside of normal parameters, that is a situation where you need to notify your clinical instructor. You need to notify the nurse, right? Just don't say, well, well I put it on the computer or I put it on the paper. No, you need to do a face-to-face. Because if the patient's blood pressure and vital signs are out of normal range, there's going to have to be some action that needs to be taken, okay? So that's something very important to communicate, okay? So don't go on break and say, oh, I'll tell them when I come back. No, you tell them right away, okay? What happens if they don't do nothing? Like, say, because I had a patient, when you just said that about your mom, that patient today, well, he wasn't a man, but all on that. But um, the one of the girls took it, and it was 205 over, like, 105. Okay. So the lady was like, oh, they probably held his blood pressure meds. I'm like, okay, so what you going to do? Is you going to wait? Or they never sent this guy out, first of all. Okay. Second of all, she got the name mixed up. So when she went to the DOE and she told him, told them it was a different patient. And when she came back two hours later, it was still high. And they was like, oh, well, let's give him his blood pressure medicine first. And I was like, 
Okay, so excuse me. So I remember you telling a story. Is this the same place we're talking about? This is the new place. So I guess all of them is just hard. These yeah. we have for real, y'all. They be taking it as a joke and they be mad when I be getting frustrated because y'all be telling when people lies and I hate it. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm sorry that that's your new place because I remember last time you told me that was my old place. So, yeah. but the new place that is a little scary. So, here's what would what's supposed to happen we get the vital signs at 205 over what 100? It was 105. Okay, so in my mind, as I'm getting this, okay, uh, if we did it with the machine, the next thing is okay, I need to do it as a manual. They did okay, that was, okay, I'm, I'm not the manual was that one. At first, it was 210 over like 115, and then the manual, it took it down just a little bit though, and the heart rate was like 136 with the machine. Okay, so that's really unacceptable. And in a long-term care facility, yes, that patient does need to go and be no. sent out. Okay. So in the meantime, while I'm waiting for the ambulance to come, that patient, I don't know why they held the blood pressure medication because it sounds like this patient's hypertension is not under control. So, and the thing is, if you hold a patient's medication for any reason, you need to notify the physician. So I just can't say, oh, well, I don't feel like giving you your blood pressure medication today. You know, now if I went and I took the patient's blood pressure and it was 90 over 50, then yes, I'm going to hold the blood pressure medication because, no. right, because it's it's low. And if I give blood pressure medication and the blood pressure is low, then it's going to get even lower, right? So that would be a reason why. But if, you know, you take it at this time, you take it manually and two hours later, it's still elevated. That tells me that their blood pressure is not controlled. They need to be on a regular uh, regimen taking this blood pressure medication. So after you call 911, right, you took the manual, you call 911 um, after notifying the chain of command. Okay, I'm going to see what blood pressure medication the patient has, and I'm going to administer that, and I'm going to document because now I have to start thinking the paramedics are coming. I'm going to have to get ready to give report. Because when they take the patient, they're going to want to know, like, the whole SBAR. We talked about SBAR in this class, right? Mm -hmm. So I would have a copy of an SBAR filled out to hand to those paramedics. And as they're taking the patient and getting the patient out of my facility, giving them the highlights, okay, of what's going on with this patient. What is the situation? What is the background? What is my assessment? What is the recommendation as they're wheeling this patient out, okay? Because now this patient is at risk for stroke and heart attack, okay? They're in a hypertensive crisis. So the other thing is, how was the patient's level of consciousness? He's, and they asked that too, but you know, have you ever been around people who feel or not they the same way? This man is just always calm. Like, he don't show any, you know what I'm saying, expression, and that's what he was saying, but Based on the vitals, I knew it didn't sound good. But I'm asking for me because when I become a nurse, I'm not playing those type of names. But that situation, even not being a nurse, I knew like those vitals weren't good. And he wasn't sent out. He actually was there all day. He ate lunch. And he don't act. You know, he don't show signs of distress he at all. He's on I don't know what he's on as far as the narcotics and all. I don't really know his medication history. Mm -hmm. I just know based off of the blood pressure that wasn't a good time. Right. And in long-term care facilities, you don't have a lot of equipment. So if something happens with your patient, they start going down. I mean, okay, you have an AED mm -hmm. and you're... Uh, you know, so you're really limited. You don't have all the things that you need. So that patient needs to be in a hospital setting. Okay, that so in my opinion, now I don't know what your procedure is for your facility, but it doesn't sound very good. It doesn't sound safe. Okay, let me ask Mrs. Smith. Quick question. So welcome. So do y'all know Mrs. Smith? No. Oh my goodness. Okay. So Mrs. Smith, quick question. You have a patient, long-term care facility, their blood pressure is 205 over 105. What do you, what would you do? Hold on, hold on. Send them out. Good. I just wanted a sanity check because she's telling me that that happened with the patient. And mm -hmm. so we're kind of talking about vital signs now. When well, you're talking about long-term, the reason I said that because you're talking about long-term care. That's and long-term care, that's typically what they do. When something's going on with the patient, they just automatically send them. Right, because they don't have Because the they don't have the equipment to take care of it. Yeah. 
Okay, good. I just wanted to see any objections you came in here today. <laughs> so you came in at the perfect time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, that's a typical thing for, for, for you know, long-term care, long nursing homes. If something's going on with the patient, doesn't matter what it is. I mean, they just they just call nine one one and send them out. Just yeah. Do you guys work in long term care? I yeah. do. Yeah. Good. But they didn't. They they, they didn't send they them didn't out. Send them oh. out. They didn't even administer blood pressure medication. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what did they do? So we're just gonna wait for the stroke signs. Right. Because that's what they said. He didn't show any signs of nothing else was wrong. He seen signs. Well, you know, the other it's thing is, too, what is his normal blood pressure? Like, what is it normally, you know? Not but, good. but you know, 200 and some over 100 and something is not normal. And his heart rate was like 130. Oh, God, no. Whoa, really? Like 136. But yeah. Yeah, so I'm that was, that's that's usually protocol for nursing homes. Yeah, that that's yeah. why I was like, yeah. oh my gosh. Yeah. But yeah, so I just wanted to say check, <laughs> and so it was good, just good reassurance. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So it's out to go. go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. 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 She is. Oh, okay. Yes, we were together. Because you know they can't go at the same time, so they don't really want the residents to go out. You do understand that, right? When they yeah. come down to the village, when they're in the hospital, they they're coming for the for the long-term care facility, and a lot of them are shutting down because a lot of people are okay. Parents are probably home; they're about to die at home because of the lack of care that they need. That they're so a lot of the directors are telling the nurses, "Hey, look, if it's not super dire, I myself had to quit because one lady was spitting up blood." Hey, this is not good come from her oh, little I got in class with the director. I said this. She's like, maybe she did her best. No, she did not. This had bile in it. What do you mean? How did you even get to your position? This had bile in her blood. It was coming from her stomach. And I took a video of her mouth and food, and then she didn't bite anything. Still would not say anything. Okay. I quit. I quit that night. That was it for me. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you, and it's very unfortunate. It's actually scary for me, right? Because yeah. if you think about it, those are the things, number one, okay, you'll lose your license, but more importantly, more importantly than losing your license, what about your humanity? Exactly. So you're turning a blind eye to a patient that needs you, and that goes against the oath of nursing that you will do no harm. So that's totally unacceptable. So because they want to collect a check, they let the patient stay there until they die. Like, that's that's very disheartening. That's very disheartening. But I applaud you for standing your ground and saying, you know, I will not tolerate this. Although, you know, I can't do this without practice. Like, when I was like, yeah, can I just please call me? You know, and then I got my doctor. Like, well, she was like, oh, well, I'll take the super account off. I said, let me tell you something. I'm not worried about my count, but I will report every piece of blood that's in this room. She never checked me again. That was, that was it for me. Like, you know, I looked at this whole thing trying to get a lot of them going to get these and I told them that I was going to family members. I told her, I said, get your mom out of here. I told her, I don't care. And she found out about that too and got mad. I don't care. Take your grandma out of here. Mm -hmm. The CNAs are not doing nothing. I'm just going to bad check. I can't give them that treatment. But I can't, you know, I mean, I can help them bathe and whatnot, but I have a lot of people. I have five parts, first of all. I mean, when it starts, like, oh, five parts. All right? Four CNAs on the that cannot get on the Directors are never going to she had me doing all her notes. So I was like, you know what? This is just too much for me. I'm really about to do blood pressure. I really, I still want to report them to be honest with you, Chief, but a lot of them will have a place to go mm -hmm. immediately. You know what I'm saying? So some here is better than none, but that place is going to be Yeah. And so you've got to make these tough decisions sometimes because it can cost you your license and don't let it cost you your own health. Because when you see something that's wrong and you want to do the right thing and you're kind of wrestling inside of your soul and your spirit and your heart and your mind, that's called moral distress. Mm -hmm. That's how nurses get burnt out. Yeah. Okay. So just be careful and be mindful of that. And so um, I really love this group because we always have these great discussions. Okay. So that's the blood pressure, right? We're talking about the blood pressure. So you, you get it. Oxygen saturation. The normal is going to be right with the pulse ox. You're going to learn that with Mrs. Colin, if you haven't already, 95 to 100, that is for your normal patient that has no respiratory issues. If my patient uh, has uh, like COPD, okay, they're probably going to live at 92, 93, and I'm going to be happy with that because that's going to be the best that they could do, okay? Um, 
Uh, let's see. So understand that as it goes down, um, you know, that's causing for concern. If you have something, again, out of normal range, please report it to your clinical instructor, to the nurse that's assigned to the patient. Yes. yes. Oh, that's a great, great question. Your, for, for your oxygen sacs? Oh, I don't know. I've never seen that before. So I would question the machine because the machine may be out of calibration. So that's a possibility. Um, and I would ask, is that patient on oxygen? That works. This is where I have worked. This is where I used to work back home in Houston for oxygen. Okay. But I remember the past. But she had COPD and she had. Is it a good thing? What's the other one? She had to be. What's, what's the other one? Um, she had trachea. Tracheostomy? No. Say it again. Emphysema. Sorry. What's the one? She had emphysema, but her thing was. Okay. So her pulse oximeter mm -hmm. reading. So my question would be so, so let me just mention something about COPD. COPD has two branches. Okay, so when we say patient has COPD, okay, let me just, I'm going to put that picture up. So, uh, COPD has two branches, and here they're going. <laughs> this is way big. So, we have what's called a pink puffer and blue bloater. Under COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you have chronic bronchitis and emphysema, okay? So your patient had emphysema. Yes. The problem with emphysema patients is that they have hyperinflated lungs and a flattened diaphragm, and they can't get out all the carbon dioxide, okay? Now, your chronic bronchitis patient, uh, they're usually um, overweight, they're a chronic smoker, Right, so these are the, the presentations, but both of these conditions fall on, under the umbrella of COPD. And with, with COPD, we don't want to give a lot of oxygen because that's actually really bad for them. So they will usually have a nasal cannula at one or two uh, liters per minute, but not a lot of oxygen because it can create a toxic situation. So my question would be, and I know you can't kind of go back in time, but were were these patient was this patient on oxygen or was the machine out of calibration? Because sometimes the machines or equipment can be out of calibration. Like every shift at Centarium, you gotta do the QA test for your glucometer, right? To make sure that it's reading high and low, that it's actually working well. Just like that scale that's in the back, right? It has to go periodically to make sure that it's within calibration. Just like your cell phone, if you don't do the updates, right, you're, you're going to have issues with your cell phone. So we just can't keep using equipment and not have it uh, tested. Okay. So I don't know, but I've never really seen that. So I, I can't tell you exactly why, but that's what uh, my initial thoughts would be. So on CO, COPD, you said it shouldn't be up high, the oxygen. Yes. So what, what happens if we do, like, do they start, like, being jittery and stuff is like they get too much oxygen is bad. Um, well, the thing is with COPD, they already have a difficult time with airway exchange, and the amount of carbon dioxide in your body is actually what triggers your respirations. So if the patient has too much oxygen, they can become toxic on oxygen and they can lose the ability for that air exchange. Okay. I just asked it because my grandma, she got a bad habit, and I was like, I don't think you're supposed to keep doing it. She would turn her oxygen on four, five, and I'm like, you got COPD. And yeah. what was you your like order? 82. She should keep it on one or two. But when she feels like she's moving around the house, I'm like, you difficult breathing because of your condition anyway. Right. It don't have nothing to do with your oxygen thing. So she feel like if she's cleaning up and can't breathe, let me turn my oxygen on four or five, and I'm like, Really, you can't mm -hmm. breathe due to your COPD. It has nothing to do with the oxygen, but her and my aunt, they're so hard. -headed. I had to stop taking care of her and then say anything, but she's very hard headed. And I knew that wasn't what you were supposed to do. Turn it on four and five because, I mean, you got COPD, so it's going to be difficult for you to breathe. Yes, and you're right. You're right. Sure. She's just hard headed. 
some <laughs> people is just stuck in a, a way. Yeah. All right. So thanks for sharing that. My goodness. All right. So when we think about the patient's oxygen oxygenation status is low, that's hypoxemia. That is dangerous because we cannot, right, our cells and tissues cannot survive without oxygen, right? The blood brings oxygen and nutrients. We need that in order to survive. So that's really important to understand. Okay, so pulse and respirations. We're going to, so this tells you like the average pulse and it gives you the average respiration. But let me make sure I have all these things in my pocket, but I don't have, like, no. So the normal respiration for an adult is 12 to 20, okay? And if it's low, I want you to think, <coughs> excuse me, Brady, I'm not sure. All right, let me look this up. I think it's in the handout. Because this is something that you have to know. I'm pretty sure this is a test question. Right? <laughs> Brady, Brady, okay, this one, this one, okay. All right, so Brady is going to be low. Okay, and then Tacky is going to be high. Yes, and I'm going to talk about Tacky part of it too. And this is what Paul? So like this is respiration. respiration. And so here's my line. This is now for heart rate. Okay, there's definitely a question on this. Brazen. Yes, that's the heart rate. Okay, so this is a question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't get any help here. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I remember last term I said, hey, this is a test question. And I still had people miss it. Like, I, I just was like, why? And I just said, this is a test question. So respiratory rate is 12 to 20. We're talking about for adults. Less than 12. If it's 10, it's bradynipnea, right? If it's 22, tachypnea, okay? And I have to ask myself a question. Why is the patient's respiratory rate low? Why is it high, right? Did they just get up and, and go to the bathroom? Did they run up the stairs? Are they on oxygen? Do they have COPD? Are they in respiratory distress? If my patient has bradynipnea, um, are they on narcotics? Because narcotics will slow down the patient's respiratory rate. That is a classic and complex kind of question. If your patient already has low respiratory rate, please don't give more. Please, please don't give morphine. Because narcotics or opioid narcotics will decrease uh, the patient's respiratory rate. Decrease on down till they can't breathe and they die. Right? So that's what we're talking oh. about. So they so that's that's fine to do. However, if you that's why you always have to get real time vital signs before you administer any medication. Don't get vital signs from two hours ago or from yesterday. I'm doing your vital signs right now. Your blood pressure is 220 over 105. Now I'm going to administer the medication. So two hours later, they can't say, oh, yeah, uh, I'm going to give the medication. No, you need a new set of vital signs. Same for blood sugar. How would I look? Yes, go ahead, man. Let me give you this a quick question. So basically, you all say uh, resident vitals, and it's not where it needs to be. It's like 
low, don't be miserable at all. Yeah, it depends, okay, because I don't want to give general term, but if their vital signs are outside of normal limits, you have to ask yourself, number one, why is it outside of normal limits? What's going on? And I'm not talking about like if you're a med tech or if you're a CNA, I'm think, talking about thinking like a nurse. Right. So if I go to Mrs. Smith and I get her blood sugar and it's, you know, 70, or I'll say if it's 50, mm -hmm. I'm not going to give her insulin. The first thing I better do is give her some doggone orange juice, right? And then, you know, get her a meal, right? Where we're going to get her simple sugars. Because if I give her her insulin, her blood sugar is going to drop even more. And those are like the classic things that test questions are made of. So I don't want to give you a blanket rule to say, but if the patient's vital signs are out of normal parameters, you have to ask yourself, what does this mean? Can I give the patient their medication that's ordered by the doctor? And I'll tell you, because I heard you all say, well, it's prescribed by the doctor. Well, that doesn't mean anything, okay? Not that it doesn't mean anything. It means a lot. However, just because a doctor has written an order for something, that doesn't mean you blindly do what, what it says. Because if I go and I get my patient's vital signs and their um, respiratory rate is six. I'm not going to administer morphine because if I do, that patient's respiratory rate will be zero, okay? So I'm going to have to contact the doctor and I'm going to say the patient is already respiratory depressed. Can we do something else? Or there may even be a PRN, something else that we can do for the patient. Because what's going to happen if you administer morphine and that patient's respiratory rate is six, they're going to probably die, okay? Mm -hmm. So even if the patient is on hospice, you don't hurry them up to die. That's not your I job. Some of you, but they, I'm, I was working as a lady who went and said, she said, somebody had their chronic life. Yeah, he, he was about to go. And she was like, yeah, I'm about to get him to So that's how our move that sometimes when we get their narcotics and our hospice is just period. Well, they don't be checking the vitals. Cause see, with the damn, I can like when nurses come in, like see me, like if I come in for work and they're like, okay, you might get the vitals. I said, do you want me to get them now or do you want me to wait until you got the medication? Because coming in at seven, six in the morning, I'll take your vitals. Mm -hmm. You probably not gonna pass no medicine until 10, 11. So that's why I always say, when I even have a situation with a nurse, she's like, oh no, I want it now. Well, it's like that time, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Like, yeah, like, 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 yeah, yeah, that's how I argue sometimes. That's how I argue that it slows down the brain. Yes. So, so you all are seeing examples of what not to do. And so, yeah. it's <laughs> in nursing, you're, you're living in the end class oh, world. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so you're living in the NCLEX world because I don't want you to see those things and be like, oh, well, the nurse, you know, the, the respiratory rate was six and she gave, you know, five milligrams of morphine, you know, 45 minutes later, the patient's dead. Because if you answer questions that way, you're not going to be successful. You have to live in the NCLEX world and you have to think critically. You just don't blindly follow orders. You have to have a questioning attitude. And in real life, you should do that as well. And I'm sorry that that's the case. Um, you know, I, I don't really know all the details, but that doesn't really make me feel too comfortable about what's happening. Yeah. That's why people don't want to leave the family and use the relay, because that's the way it's happening. Very okay. euthanizing. Yeah. yeah. So just be mindful of that and don't be that nurse. But understand respiratory rate is 12 to 20. If it's lower than 12, it's bradynipnea. If it's greater than 20, it's tachypnea. The heart rate for, and these are adults we're talking about. I'm just focusing on, focusing on adults right now. The heart rate for adults is 60 to 100. If it's less than 60, it's bradycardia. That is going to be a cause for concern because if the heart rate is less than 60, the heart is not pumping enough blood to perfuse the tissues. And what does perfuse the tissues mean? It means to get the blood that has oxygen and nutrients all the way to your fingertips, all the way to your toes. If cells and tissues don't have oxygen and nutrients, they die. Okay, so bradycardia uh, is uh, something to look at. Now, what if a patient is a, like a, an Olympic athlete? Well, they may have a low heart rate, a low resting heart rate. So Michael Phelps, 
um, you know, somebody that runs triathlons, that kind of thing, they probably have a really low resting heart rate, okay? And that's going to be normal for them, okay? Uh, when I was getting out of the military, I was looking at my medical record, and I saw when I was in the Marine Corps, we would run all the time, and I was looking, I was like, man, my resting heart rate was like at a 60. I was like, man, that is so good. Now it's so different. Right. But because of someone being, you know, um, tell, right. So you're an army person. Do you know what your resting heart rate is? I sure don't, but I know I have low blood pressure. Uh -huh. So high blood pressure for me would be normal, but my oh. blood pressure is low. Okay. So is it because of dehydration or is that just your norm? That's just my norm. Your norm. Okay. So that's a good point, and thank you for sharing that with us, because the other question is, what is the baseline? And that's what Mrs. Smith was asking. Is that the normal, you know, the patient having a 200 over 100, is that their norm? But even if that's their norm, that's still not good, okay? So, but you know that this patient has a low blood pressure, and they may be fine, like asymptomatic, right? So we have to really understand that, okay? Um, and so if your patient normally has lower blood pressure, if it's higher, I would say, okay, well, what's different? Okay. And so that's why when you go to clinical, you're going to see what is the baseline or what is the trend for that patient? Because you just can't take one thing. You have to take all the pieces of information and analyze it. So that's what critical thinking is about. Okay. So another thing that's important with the heart rate, if I'm going to administer a cardiac medication like digoxin, that is a cardiac glycoside, because y'all are in form right now, right? No. Mm -hmm. not next week. Oh, next time. Okay. So, okay, I'll give you less details. But if I have to give a cardiac medication and the patient's heart rate is 60 or less, I'm going to hold that medication because those cardiac medications, specifically digoxin, and digoxin is like a, a frequent favorite on tests and NCLEX and everything. If it's less than that, I'm going to have a problem because the way digoxin works is it makes the heart beat more forcefully, so it beats less times. So anything less than 60 beats per minute is not enough to perfuse the body, okay? So I would hold that medication and contact the chain of command, whoever's in charge. So what is it they know about you were saying with the other stuff? If that's their norm, I would question if they would even need the joxin. So, but even without the joxin, is that somebody's norm? Is that something you would question, or is it like certain illnesses will have you have that low heart rate? Uh, yes, there are certain illnesses, and I, I know that there's some I can't think of them right now. I but, can't either because I got a patient and they said something he got. And I'm like, mm -hmm, 38. It was like, yeah, that's the norm for him. And it really is, though. Every, any day, I come to that unit and take his vitals, 38, 42 maybe is the highest I've ever seen. That's so I mean. would ask the question. That's it. What's that? Bradycardia. That's what so, they said. So yes, bradycardia, that's low no, heart rate. No, I know they said that, but it's something else. It, it is something. So the next thing is, okay, is the patient symptomatic or are they asymptomatic? Because if you go in and the patient's heart rate is 38, but they're watching TV, yeah. they're talking to you, Okay, that's one thing, but if the patient's heart rate is 38 and they're slumped over in their chair, like that's not good. Okay, that's not good. So the next time you see that patient, you he know. always in the bed watching TV and make sure his food has. That's all he talks about. Yeah, I can't remember he really, what it he, is. He goes to the bathroom, everything. he has his own room. He don't need what from us. He just want his food high and stay there watch TV. Okay. Okay. But I, I can't think of it either, but this is a patient that will need probably need a pacemaker. So I'm surprised, okay. but they maybe didn't give him a pacemaker because he maybe is too old or maybe he couldn't stand the surgery. Like he's not strong enough because there's other things other going things. on because the pacemaker is an extremely invasive procedure. So um yeah so but i'm gonna have to look that up and i'll post it in yeah, the i gotta i'm gonna find out too because okay. they they be saying stuff around here maybe but i'm not that bothered uh, okay well just write it down write yeah, it down so yeah, that's yeah. how you work out yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right so tachycardia that's over 100 beats per minute so why would a patient have tachycardia well it's normal 
stress, but if you're working out, your heart rate's going to get up there, right? Mm -hmm. But after you cool down, you do your cool down, your stretches, you're drinking water, your heart rate should come back down, right? If your patient's in pain, their heart rate's going to be elevated, okay? If your patient's having difficulty breathing, their heart rate's going to be elevated. They're going to have tachycardia, okay? So remember, tachy is over the normal limits and breathing is lower than the normal limits. Any questions about that? Mm -mm. Okay, all right, good. Let's talk about the pulses. Tell me anything you know about the pulses. So why don't you find it right now on yourself? Go ahead and find it right now on yourself. So y'all can go Don't use your thumb because there's a pulse in your thumb, okay? All right, so let's take a look at this handout for vital signs because this was just like the kind of the cheat sheet to get us into it. I really like this handout because it gives you uh, a lot of information so you can understand, right? And we kind of started talking about it already. But the vital signs are important. They are vital. That's why they're called vital signs. So the vital signs include body temperature, the pulse, the heart rate, respiration, blood pressure. Okay, the fifth vital sign is pain, okay, is pain. Every time you uh, go in and assess your patient, it is good practice, and it should be like this. Hello, Mrs. Smith, my name is Colleen, I'm gonna be your nurse today, okay? How are you doing today? Okay, do you have any pain? Right, that's that's how it should always be. Just when you go in, you introduce yourself. If they have loved ones in the room, you you know, is it okay if we uh, discuss your medical condition in front of your family? Don't assume that if it's the husband, the wife, or whoever, that it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes spouses are in the hospital and they have STI. They don't want the spouse to know they have an STI. Okay. I had a patient one time who was HIV positive. He didn't want that his mother was at the bedside. He was an adult, he was a young adult, but he didn't want his mother to know. So we had to go in and we didn't say, oh, here is your antiviral medication, right? We were not doing any patient teaching because then the mother would be like, it's not antiviral, what? So we would just silently give him his medication. 
because his mother never really left the bedside. She only left because she had to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, just for that, I think uh, I can handle anything I can handle. The blood, the guts, the anything. But for some reason, when I get to, like, when I have to go in the room with an HIV patient or somebody is going on, I freeze up. It just happens every mm -hmm. day. It's just been my last couple of days. Yeah, I don't know why. It's a lady mother. Yeah. 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 Y
the RN is going to be the one to do that initial assessment, right? So the RN is going to be the one to initiate the plan of care. The RN is going to be the one to initiate the teaching. The LPN is going to be the one that reinforces everything, okay? Reinforces. So in the NCLEX world, if you see that, that's how you should answer those kinds of questions, okay? All right, if there is a change in the patient's condition, take the vital signs. If so, Mrs. Smith was, you know, she was confused. She was fine before. Take the vital signs. And that also includes the blood sugar, right? Because that could be a reason for the patient becoming confused. Oxygenation could be a, an issue why the patient is becoming confused or restless. If the patient is having any procedures, like surgical procedures, if they're going down, they're leaving your eyesight or your unit, get baseline vitals before they leave, and when they come back, get another set of vitals. Because when I let Mrs. Jones go, it was, uh, I'm sorry, Mercedes, your last name, Jones. Yeah. <laughs> so when I let Mrs. Jones go, but when she came back, from that procedure, her blood pressure is low. Maybe she has it, okay? So um, if there's anything that may be risky that may cause harm to the patient, you want to get those vital signs, okay? If I am administering blood pressure medication, insulin, anything that could affect those vital signs, I need to reassess, okay? So if I give that patient that had the 200 over 100 blood pressure, if I give low pressure, hydrolazine, you know, the doctor, whatever the patient was prescribed, one hour later, I better come back and look at their vital sign, okay? If I give the patient pain medication, because pain is a big vital sign, I better come back one hour later and assess their pain. And we're assessing pain on a pain rating scale, and I'll pull that up in just a second, okay? Any questions about that? Is it rating the differential every hour? Or is it just the um, now, you're talking um, about if the patient's condition is not stable. Yes. So it depends, because uh, it depends. If it is a post-op patient, I am going to, uh, in the beginning, when they're freshly out, I'm going to be taking it every 15 minutes. That includes your postpartum patient. I'm going to take it every 15 minutes for the first hour. And then the second hour is probably going to be every half an hour. And if everything is normal, then it's going to then go for four hours. So it's also going to depend on the hospital and the protocol, but understand that if a patient is freshly out of a procedure or surgery, it's every 15 minutes, at least for that first hour, okay? So that's going to be important because if they're just out of surgery, what if, if they're hemorrhaging, we have to really monitor them carefully, okay? A lot of times also they just out of surgery, we got to make sure that their airway is still intact because sometimes they can be intubated. So, and that's the reason why. So we have to look at it, okay? So body temperature, things that can, so when we think about the core body temperature, we're looking at 98.6 Fahrenheit. That's the normal, I'm on page two of this, okay? Now, true core temperature is gonna be by invasive means, okay? And that's placing the temperature probe in the esophagus, the pulmonary. So the rectal temperature is gonna be probably the best, but we don't do rectal temperatures every day, okay? That's not, hey, come on, let me get your rectal temp, right? <laughs> it's only if we absolutely need to, okay? Uh, because it is not very pleasant to do a rectal temp for the nurse and for the patient, but sometimes we do have to do it. And I've already warned you, it's gonna be a, a, a thermometer that has a little red thing around it. It's for the rectum, please don't use it orally. Please always use the covering the sheets that go with it, okay? All right. Um, another thing to think about when you're assessing the patient's body temperature, if you go into the room and the patient is drinking a soda, do not, you're going to have to come back. When you get their oral temperature, it's going to be low. They were just drinking an ice cold soda. Same thing. If you're drinking a hot cup of tea, that, that temperature is not going to be accurate. Okay, so you have to keep that in mind. Okay. Um, temperature... Okay, so here's some things on page three, things that affect the body's heat production, okay? So it could be a thyroid kind of situation, muscle activity, okay? 
If the patient is shivering, right, that could increase their basic metabolic rate and their ability to uh, make heat. The age of the patient, uh, so the very young and the very old are very sensitive to heat. So babies, right, they cannot thermoregulate. So that's why after they're born, the first thing we do is suction the nose and the mouth. The second thing we do is dry them off and swaddle them, put a hat on, because we're concerned about cold stress, okay? Because they cannot regulate their, their body temperatures, right? Now, they do have brown fat that they can burn, right, if they're hypothermic, but they only have a little bit. So once they burn that brown fat and they keep trying to burn, you know, they'll keep going through calories, now this infant, this newborn that was cold is at risk for hypoglycemia, like low blood sugars, right? Mm -hmm. Because they only have a little bit of brown fat, okay? Now your geriatric patients, they're at risk because they have lost that subcutaneous layer, right? So how many of you see the geriatric patients and they got thin mm -hmm. skin? Mm -hmm. So our layers of skin, remember from A&P, maybe? Mm -hmm. I don't, are we all doing A&P right now? Mm -hmm. So epidermis, dermis is underneath, and then the hypodermis. The hypodermis is sometimes called the subcutaneous layer. Geriatric patients, they have lost most of that. So that's why their skin is not as firm uh, and also loss of collagen and elastin. But they lost that subcutaneous layer, so they're really cold, okay? And I know Ms. Holland told y'all, when y'all do a bed bath, don't expose the patient, have mm -hmm. discretion. They're going to be freezing, all of that, right? Okay, so other things that affect your, your body, um, your heat production, diurnal variation. So different times of day, right, your body temperature is going to be different. If a woman is ovulating, we know that if you're trying to conceive, they may, you know, track it and they will take their vape, they'll take their oral temperature and when it's slightly elevated, okay, yep, that's my, I'm ovulating, let's go, right? Because <laughs> they're, they're ovulating that day and that's the day that they're likely to get pregnant. So obviously, if a patient is exercising or if they're, ex you know, uh, exerting themselves with physical activity, that's going to increase their body temperature as well. Uh, alterations in body temperature, pyrexia. If the patient is above normal, right, um, uh, then that's going to be a fever. What is going on if a patient has a fever? Infection, I'm thinking infection, and that is a normal body response when there is an infection present, okay? If the temperature is over um, 105, it's hyperpyrexia. Once a patient has a fever, that especially if it's like 103, 104, I get nervous and I think, okay, this patient may end up having seizures, okay? So we have to be very mindful of that, okay? All right, so here's on page four, it tells you about the different kinds of fevers, intermittent fevers, remittent fevers, relapsing, and constant fevers. Do you have to necessarily know that right now? No, you'll probably need to know that next term, okay? So I'm not going to focus on that too much, okay? So clinical signs, <laughs> it's not a bad thing to know. You're going to have to know it eventually. Okay, clinical signs of fever, onset. So what happens? Increased heart rate, respiratory rate and depth, shivering, cold skin because of vasoconstriction, cyanotic nail beds, right? Okay, complaining of feeling cold, goose flesh appearance of skin. And we know those goose bumps are actually because the erector pili muscle that's actually on each shaft of hair is contracting and that's what makes goose bumps, okay? Say again. Oh, you didn't have this? I'm sorry. Does everybody have the vital sign sheet? Does anybody not have the vital sign sheet? Because that's what we're going over right now. Sorry. I'm on page four. Okay, so okay. Um, so these are the things that the onset of a fever, right? And the, the body temperature is rising, and you already know that it's because of infection. So the, if the skin feels warm. Right now, okay, this patient, I know. So if you ever had children or maybe you remember as a child and your grown-up puts the back and the back of your hand is what you use, right? On the forehead, oh my, little Johnny, little Susie, you feel warm. Okay, so let me go ahead and take your temperature. They're going to have an increased pulse and respiratory rate, increased thirst. We have to push fluids for this patient because they're losing a lot of their fluids from the fever and insensible 
water loss. I don't think that test question is for this class. I think it's for another one. Um, so never mind. All right. So increased thirst. So we want to push fluid, mild to severe dehydration, drowsiness, restlessness, delirium. So what is delirium? Yes, they're confused. They can have hallucinations. When a patient has delirium, that is an acute uh, kind of condition. As long as we uh, determine what the underlying cause is and we resolve it, then the patient can be restored. Dementia is going to be a chronic condition that there is no restoring the patient, okay? Mm -hmm. That's a big thing that you're going to see over and over um, as you assess patients. You're going to see it in geriatrics. You're going to see it in mental health, delirium versus dementia, okay? Okay, so loss of appetite with prolonged fever as well. Now, there's going to be malaise. Malaise means the patient just does not feel well, right? Very good, Raven. Mm -hmm. Weakness, aching muscles, okay? And that's due to protein being broken down. Mm -hmm. Now, the abatement stage, abatement means it's kind of receding. It's it's not, you know, it's, it's getting better. So what's happening is the, they're going to have flushed, warm skin. They're going to be sweating, decreased shivering, possible dehydration. So that tells me if in this stage, right, um, I have to make sure that my patient is well hydrated. I have to offer them fluids. I also am concerned about their skin integrity because if they're shivering, if they're sweating, right, okay, their skin is moist. We know that that's not going to be good for our patient. So I want to keep their skin dry and intact, okay? All right. And the best way to tell if your geriatric patient is dehydrated is look at the oral mucosa. So for your other patients, you may pinch over the clavicles, okay? And that's called skin turgor, right? Skin turgor, okay? All right. So nursing interventions for a patient with a fever. We're going to monitor their vital signs, right? And this is what this whole lecture has been about, vital signs. Assess skin color and temperature. What is appropriate for their ethnicity, okay? And staff can stay with them. All right, monitor white blood cell count and other lab values because if a patient has an infection, what's going to happen with the white blood cell count? It's going to be elevated. That's right, okay? I'm going to measure their eyes and nose. You're going to remove excess clothes, okay? Reduce physical activity, provide oral hygiene to keep those uh, mucous membranes moist. They can become dry and cracked, right? And we don't want that because whenever skin breaks and cracks, now that's where infection can inter be introduced. So you want to keep the room cool. Now, if your patient has severe kinds of fever, hypothyrexia, we can put um, ice packs under their axilla and in their groin. Okay, that will help reduce their temperature. If the patient can tolerate it and if it's uh, prescribed, sometimes we even give patients ice baths, okay? All right. The artery when you overheat, they call it ice sheet. And since I overheat a lot, but I went to basic in December, they would give me ice sheets, but it's already cold outside, so I would go into hypothermic shock. And they'd be like, Oh my god, what's wrong with her? Well, if you don't put ice sheets on me, it's 10 degrees outside, I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> You're literally freezing to them. Yes. So when I was in boot camp, in the Marine Corps boot camp, we would have this thing, if you, you know, pass out from heat exhaustion, they would say, you got to stay hydrated else you're going to get the silver bullet. Ah, they, <laughs> they don't still, do that here. They don't do that. Okay, so the silver bullet is when they lay you in the prone position. They will and, take off all your clothes. And they will bear your buttocks, and they will get that rectal temperature, right? They because sure that's going to be the best way to tell what your body temperature is if you're in the military and you, you get heat exhaustion. And, 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 and when, if you see that one time, that makes you want to drink a full can canteen of water. I'll tell you what, because you don't want to be the one to get the silver bullet. And that's a real thing. Okay, well, I'm happy that they don't do that anymore. Um, okay, anyway, so <laughs> hypothermia. So that was a perfect story that you told us. So this patient has hypothermia. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to put heating blankets on them, increase the heat that's maybe in the room. Now, the thing is, you got to be careful because if you have a patient that has thin skin and they're bed bound, and you keep putting all these blankets on them, that's extra weight. Now we're putting pressure on them and they can have a pressure ulcer or they can have skin breakdown, okay? Okay. 
experiences to share and one nurse could have made the difference if a nurse intervened and did teaching with the patient did teaching with the family and said okay i know mr smith is cold instead of putting five or six blankets on him maybe we can adjust his clothing maybe he can have fleece sweatpants or maybe he can wear a sweatshirt Mm -hmm. maybe he can even have gloves and a hat on that would be better than putting all of these heavy blankets on him and now, okay, if he has the blankets on him, are we, you know, positioning him, repositioning him? Are we assessing those heels? Are we maybe putting on Prevlon boots or doing maybe positioning some pillows so that weight is not on his heel? Because I know when they're in dialysis, they have to have their, their legs elevated, that kind of thing. But this is what we're talking about, that critical thinking and clinical judgment that going to save this patient's life. Yeah. Even though he was a dialysis patient, he didn't necessarily have to be on the pathway to death, right? Because right. that's what it sounds like yeah. he is on right now. Yeah. Okay, he I didn't have to get that amputation. Yeah. Say that again. I said he does have a deep in my yeah. And the nurses are like, a lot of nurses now, they be so, like you said, overwhelmed. So they just be like, whatever, let the family do whatever make them happy. But a lot of family members are not educated. So... Right. Two minutes of a heart-to-heart education is not going to hurt. Even though you're overwhelmed, you still have to remember that we're here to help people, you know, keep their life in order. And she didn't know. So she thought her husband was cold, put all these blankets, mm-hmm. but them blankets, y'all know bad blankets. They are heavy. They're heavy. That man got four or five bad blankets on every day that I come in to work. Yeah. So that's, that's unfortunate. But again, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. One little bit of that's an example. Okay, so let's talk about electric blankets for a second. Mm-hmm. Because that you should not in the NCLEX world in real life, do not give your patients electric blankets. Oh, one of them got it. And I said that's probably why she tripping in there. Yes. So it, don't ever choose that as a test answer. Do not give your patients electric blankets. Especially your diabetics. They can't feel anything. So they end up getting burned. Okay, so please, that's not the right answer on NCLEX and in real life. Don't do that to them. No, no because that. they will, because they won't know if they're getting burned. Okay, so here's a, a true story. My mom's a diabetic, right? And so my sister gave her an electric blanket for Christmas or something, and then she's like, "Oh, I got burned." I'm like, "What?" She's like, "Oh, I fell asleep with the electric blanket, and because of my neuropathy, I didn't feel it." And it was a really bad burn. And I'm like, you're lucky that you didn't, that burn didn't get infected because your, your leg would have been chopped off. Oh, oh right. So that's mm-hmm. what could happen. Right? So with a blanket is over here, I didn't know people asked. I just don't believe, like, unless you lay under it, I don't believe in it. But I yeah. didn't know it can do all that. Yeah. No you get it on one. Yeah. Not saying feel. You know what I mean? Oh, you can feel. You can feel the toilet. Oh, okay. <laughs> and no. if a patient has neuropathy, they can't feel if they're getting burned. 
Okay, so this is a thing. Is she diabetic? Yes. Okay. Okay, well, is it like a heating pad that's plugged in or is it? Because if she falls asleep with that, now some electric blankets have like a, it cuts off, it cuts off automatically. Yeah. Um, I mean, personally, I would not do that. And definitely in the NFLEX world, don't do it. Don't do it. It's just not good. Okay. All right. So good, good, good. All right. Excuse me. All right. So clinical signs of hypothermia, decreased body temperature, pale school, can't, pale school, waxy skin, hypotension, decreased urine output, lack of muscle coordination, disorientation, and drowsiness. Okay. Uh, may cause a coma. All right, so when we're assessing draw, um, body temperature, we're doing it all orally, axillary, and I'm turning page seven, rectally, the tympanic membrane. Okay. Yeah, page seven I'm on now. Tympanic membrane, right? So we're just placing it. Um, oh, no, sorry. That's the temporal. Tympanic is inside of the ear. So you're going to be doing this, I think, with Mrs. Holland again, if you haven't already started doing this still, so you can see it. Okay, and I think uh, what I might do, does Mrs. Holland show you all videos of these skills or mm -hmm. does she just do it like yeah. this? She shows you videos. Video. Okay, so you're showing, she's showing you the video, so that's fine. Okay, so contraindication of oral thermometer, contraindication, we can't do it for this patient, okay? So a child is under six years, unconscious patients, psychiatric patients. Okay, patients who can't breathe from their nose, mouth surgery or infection, patient on an oxygen mask, don't use an oral thermometer. Okay, in contraindications for a rectal thermometer. If your patient had rectal surgery, don't give them rectal temp, okay? If they have a rectal disorder like hemorrhoids, don't do it. If they have diarrhea, don't do it, okay? If they have blood coming out of their anus, please don't give them a rectal temp, okay? So you got to think about these things, okay? So there's different types of thermometers, electronic, glass, okay? Um, and so let's talk, uh, let's look uh, real quick. We kind of started talking about it. Actually, Ms. Hospitalis' uh, scenario was actually covering all of these things on page eight. When we talked about heat exhaustion, that's one of the things like in the military, right? So it's we're concerned about heat stroke and heat exhaustion. Well, heat exhaustion will come first and then heat stroke and then hypo on the cold side, right? Hypothermia and then frostbite, okay? So heat exhaustion, if it's 100 degrees outside or what we call black flag conditions, well, I'm not gonna go out there and do all of my yard work, right? That's just not a good idea. Test questions will look like the patient is running five miles at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. That's not a good idea. From 10 to 2 o'clock is the hottest times of the sun, okay? If it's really hot outside, patients should not be outside doing uh, activities, okay? Because that's going to put them at risk for dehydration. But once you get to pharmacology, that's going to put them at risk for medication toxicity and other side effects, okay? So understand there's heat exhaustion, heat stroke. Stroke is more severe. Hypothermia, that's low body temperature. And then frostbite. The issue with frostbite is those cells and tissues are now frozen, and sometimes they can actually now uh, have to be amputated because of gangrene. So frostbite can be pretty serious, okay? All right, so let's go to page nine when we think about potential altered body temperature that's related to, right? It could be illness or trauma, okay? Medication or vigorous activity. Okay, so here's an example of hypothermia. I had a patient one time that he was out boating in the Chesapeake Bay, his boat capsized, and he was treading water for like two or three hours before he was rescued. He had severe hypothermia, acute renal failure, sunburn, and some other things, right? Because he was out there, but he was alive, right? Okay, so that's what we're talking about. <laughs> he, he was, I was like, oh my goodness. Our ineffective thermoregulation is an ex another example of a nursing diagnosis. 
risk for imbalanced body temperature is another one. Okay, so that's just an example of your nursing diagnosis. So let's, we talked about the pulse. What you have to know about the pulse, we are measuring the quality, the rate, and the rhythm, okay, and the volume. Okay, so how does the pulse feel? When we talk about the quality, how does it feel? Is it bounding? Is it weak? Is it thready? What kind of patient would have a thready pulse? Not say again? Geriatric. Geriatric patient might, right? A dehydrated patient may, right? Fluid volume deficit, they're going to have a thready pulse. A patient that is going into hypovolemic shock will probably have a thready pulse. What kind of patient will have a bounding pulse? Bounding. bounding. So when you think bounding, you think, I think um, like Tigger, that's from Winnie the Pooh, he's like jumping all around, very strong, forceful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Right? Tachycardia. Tachycardia, fluid volume overload, because the heart is working really hard because of all of the extra fluid, okay? Okay, fluid volume overload. Okay, so if my patient came in and they had um a pulse that was sixty. Yeah, so say the pulse is low, the doctor was really not gonna give me LASIK medication. Okay, so so let's talk about what LASIK is for. LASIK is for fluid volume overload, mm -hmm. right? So the patient has extra fluid. Right. But it sounds like if their heart rate is 60 and their blood pressure is normal, that they don't need LASIKs at that time. Right. So, but if the patient had edema of the lower extremities, like swelling, okay, and I'm talking about like pitting edema where you press your finger and it stays and depressed, the they're going to need that. Yes, they're going to need that LASIK. If the patient has crackles, uh, they have like C, uh, CHF, congestive heart failure. That means they have excess fluid in their lungs. They're going to need the Lasix, okay? Mm -hmm. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Oh, and, sound. Is sound? Crackles. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. So crackles is one of the sounds. So crackles are wet lung sounds. And I can post this. Well, that, that's I think that's going too far. I don't want to give you all too much because this is already a lot. But when you get to med surge, you're going to have to listen to the lung sounds. You're going to have to know what wheezing sounds like, what crackles, ronchi, rails, because that's going to tell you if my patient has wheezing, I know that this is probably asthma, and I better give albuterol. Crackles is pneumonia. They could have pneumonia. Um, if they're wheezing, maybe, but usually with pneumonia, it's going to be crackles. It's going to be crackles. Okay. But that's that's great. So that's something to come uh, to look forward to. So when we think about the patient's pulse. Right, we have to understand the quality, the rate, okay? Is it going at, at a normal rate? Is it regular? So we want the patient's pulse to be regular. Like it should be like on time. So if you're a musician, it's like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It just keeps going, right? Uh, but if the patient's pulse was like one, two, three, four, one, two. Three, four. Something is going on, right? Because it should be regular. So that's what we mean by regular versus irregular. So on this sheet, it tells you about bradycardia, tachycardia. Um, it tells you about dysrhythmia. Dysrhythmia is an abnormal rhythm of the heart. So when we think about the heart, we have the PQRST, like when somebody gets an EKG, that's what we're listening for, right? That that's I'm sorry, that's what we're looking for. If the patient has a dysrhythmia, their PQRST complex is not normal. And you don't really have to worry about that, but just know that um, we have we look out for that, okay? So um, on page 11, it talks about the volume, okay? If it's full, easily palpable, weak, thready, strong, bounding, right? And here's the scale that you, you should know. Uh, pulse volume scale. So zero, the pulse is absent, okay? And remember, we're palpating both pulses bilaterally, simultaneously, except for the carotid. And one is going to be weak and thready pulse. That's my geriatric patient, my dehydrated patient, my hypovolemic patient. Normal pulse is going to be two. A bounding pulse is going to be three. That's like my patient that has fluid volume overload. 
So what can increase my patient's pulse? Pain, fever, stress, exercise, bleeding, a decrease in blood pressure, okay? Because when your blood pressure is dropping, your heart rate is going to pick up to try to make up for that low blood pressure, okay? Some medications can increase the pulse rate. Albuterol may give the patient like feelings of jitteriness, palpitations, right? Things that may slow the pulse, rest, increase in age, people with thin body size, some medications, and then thyroid gland disturbances. Another thing that can lower a patient's pulse or heart rate is they Valsalva. If you have a patient that already has bradycardia and you're administering an enema or they're straining, they're trying to poop right past their stool, that can actually drop their heart rate. So when you're every, yes, straining, right? Trying to pass their stool if they're constipated. So that's, so that's why it's important when you're administering an enema on your patient that you keep talking to them because as you administer the enema, you are actually stimulating cranial nerve number 10, that vagus nerve, and that will drop their heart rate, okay? All right. So this page 13 tells you the location of all of the pulses that you're going to go over. Yes, with Mrs. Holland. It's stimulating their vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10. So did you already, you're an A&P, right? Yeah. Did you yeah. already talk about the nervous system? Okay, good. So ask your teacher to talk to you specifically about cranial nerve number 10, the vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. Because that vagus nerve is uh, the one that actually uh, innervates your internal organs, your viscera. And so if you stimulate it, it can drop the patient's heart rate. Yeah, was actually when the patient was not uh, necessarily an enema. After he had the enema, he was throwing up real bad. Then he died the next day. Damn. Well, um, okay. That's why I asked. I was like, um, well, I'm not really sure because I see that there's a lot of things because we don't know why the patient was getting an enema. We don't know the other conditions, that right. kind of thing. So. Usually, you would see the reaction right then and there when it's happening. So another thing with an enema, if you do it too fast, the patient's going to feel a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the test questions could be if the patient complains of cramping when you're administering the enema, lower the bag. Because the enema is being delivered at a higher rate, the higher the bag is. But if you lower the bag, and this this bag I'm talking about has the solution for the enema that's being inserted in the patient's anus, right? So if you lower it, it's going to slow down. So there could have been a lot of things. Yeah. Usually we give patients enemas because of fecal impaction constipation. So he could have died. The patient could have died because of a number of reasons. I don't want to say it's because of... You can, right? Yeah. No, no, but don't nurses even but but that is unfortunately yeah. what it is. But I like your questioning attitude because it could have been, it could have been. Yeah. So, but and that's what you. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, we have to know a little bit more. But when you all go to clinical, yes, when you all go to clinical, these are the things that your clinical instructor will be going over with you. Okay, so these are the pulse points and pressure points on page 14. Okay, peripheral pulse on page 15. Okay, and <clears throat> something that's really important is the apical pulse. Apical pulse on page 16. Apical pulse is how you're going to know what the patient's heart rate is. The apical pulse, oh, my time is up. Okay, the apical pulse, left midclavicular line. Fifth intercostal space. For women, it's usually right where our breast is. If you have to move the patient's breast, use the back of the hand. If the patient can't move the breast for you, please don't be cupping people's breasts. That's not going to be a good thing for you, okay? So use the back of your hand. Use the back of your hand if the patient can't move their breast. If you have to use your stethoscope and listen to the patient's apical pulse. The apical pulse is at the base of the heart, and that gives you the real heart rate. So when we talk about those cardiac medications like digoxin, you have to listen for a full 60 seconds before administering that medication. If I assess the apical pulse, left midclavicular line, fifth intercostal space, 
and it's less than 60, I'm going to hold the digoxin. I'm going to notify the healthcare provider, okay? That's really important concept for this class and for nursing and for everything else, okay? Okay, so I think with Mrs. Holland, you're also going to be looking at respirations. The thing with respirations, make sure that you don't tell the patient, oh, I'm going to count your respirations because that's going to affect the way that they breathe. Act like you're taking a pulse, but looking at them, right? And you're taking, they're, they're looking at their respiration. So when you inhale and exhale, that's one, okay? And uh, do, count it as you're learning for a full 60 seconds. But, you know, the, the trick is sometimes you can do it for 30 seconds, multiply it by two. But if it's not within normal parameters, do it for a full minute, for real. Uh, that's why you have to have a secondhand watch. That's going to be important. Okay, and there's different kinds of breathing. You don't necessarily have to know right now, but when you get to fundamentals and med surge, you're going to have to know the different kinds of breathing. Okay, um, then the blood pressure, we talked about the parameters. And with Mrs. Holland, you're going to actually do the blood pressure. Understand that age can affect the patient's blood pressure if they exercise, if they have stress, obesity, uh, their gender. Medications can also affect the blood pressure as well. Okay, on page 22, it gives you different conditions that affect blood pressure. And this is a good table to kind of look at and start trying to. Yes, fact, selected conditions affecting blood pressure on page 22. Okay, so that's going to be something that's going to be good because when you see these test questions, you're doing your case studies, you're going to be able to start putting these concepts together. Right. So, um, and I think Mrs. Holland will go over the rest when you actually are doing the vital signs. Okay. So we did not make it through health assessment to my sad, sad, sad um, days because it's it's a lot of information. So with the health assessment, this is a lot of details. This packet is for RN. Um, I'm going to share with you a video that I've done a lecture with using this as a resource. So I'll post it in the classroom for health assessment. Okay. Um, so you may be wondering, okay, what's all on the test? Okay. So the material from chapter, from weeks three and four, three and four, are on the test, right? And that's always in your syllabus. You can always look in your okay. syllabus. Okay. Three and four on exam two. Yes, weeks three and four is going to be on exam two. So if you look at your syllabus, it tells you chapter four, five, six, twenty-one. The vital signs is going to be on there. Chapter seven, documentation of nursing care, communication, nurse-patient relationship, and then assessing the patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, yes, it's a lot of information, and some of it we did not discuss, but when we meet for our review, I'll focus on the most important things. Uh, yes, tomorrow. I can't believe it's tomorrow. Um, yeah, so you have plenty of time. You have plenty of time. So, the next thing, the next thing uh, to mention, as you all are packing up, um, if you don't get, like, you have to check your emails so mm -hmm. you know, or check your Canvas because it's going to be sent that way. So check your emails every day. That's a good practice, okay? Mm -hmm. Next week is going to be Nurses Appreciation Week. Oh, yeah. Right? It's Nurses Week, so mm -hmm. just know that. There's going to be a lot of special things that are going on on the campus, okay? Um, yeah. <laughs> You never got your Easter gift. All right. Does anybody have any questions? No. Okay. All right. You, you all are fantastic. Let me see if the online folks have anything. Okay. No. Okay. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop it and I'm going to um, download it and then I will post this to the classroom before I leave the building. All right. Thank you, Deja. Thank you, Quay. I hope you will feel better. Yeah.